Technology is everywhere, and so should a systematic philosophical reflection on technology. The Working Group on Philosophy of Technology, WGPT, at the University of Leuven in Belgium, aims to create a platform to do precisely that. You're listening to WGP Talks, a series where we give the opportunity to our own members to talk about what fascinates them at the crossroads of technology and society. Today we turn the tables and interview Massimiliano Simons on the ambiguity of technoscience. Massimiliano Simons did a postdoc at the University of Ghent on the concept of technoscience. He was also one of the founding members of the Working Group on Philosophy of Technology. And he will start his assistant professorship in philosophy of technology at Maastricht University in the next academic year. So welcome, Asamoyama Simons. We're glad to have you. Thank you, Hannes. Um, I'm glad to be here and to, uh, for once, answer questions instead of asking them. And well, th the first question I would like to ask you is, since we're going to talk about technoscience, it's a bit of a weird concept. Could you explain me what exactly is technoscience? How should we understand it? So the notion of technoscience, well, the intuition behind it is that it refers to a number of recent hyped scientific disciplines. So it was originally mainly linked with nanotechnology as a kind of new way of doing science, very applied, but at the same time also very focused on deep fundamental questions about the nature of material. But it has also been used then for the discipline that I'm interested in, synthetic biology, so the building and redesigning of biological systems using new synthetic methods and not just analyzing existing biological systems. And in the meantime, then the question is raised, can we also apply this to robotics, using robotic systems to study ourselves, to study our movements, and also data science. Like, can algorithms tell us something about what intelligence is? So the intuition behind it is a bit that kind of classical distinction between science and engineering, understanding things, building things, fundamental applied science, etc., is a bit blurred in these fields because they are not just applied sciences, they always build things, but also to answer, at least in their own words, fundamental questions about the nature of life, materiality, intelligence, movements, and so on. Okay, thank you. That's that's good to get a grasp on, on the well intuition behind it, but can you elaborate maybe a bit on, on what precisely the concept technoscience means? There the tricky bit starts because many philosophers have used that notion in many different ways. And for instance, one of these ambiguities that I speak of is precisely on that level between a very philosophical way of using that term and a very historical way of using that term. So the philosophical claim is then we need to talk about science in terms of technoscience because our image of what science is is actually wrong. We have to reconceptualize what science is and we should give it a new name, technoscience. So science has always been technoscience, we just misunderstood it, and these new disciplines show us how we misunderstood science. The contrasting claim is more that technoscience refers to a kind of historical shift. There was something that actually was science, but then something happened to it, and then you have to identify what that is, and then it has become technoscience. And so it has transformed itself into technoscience. And you see already a tension between these two claims. Science at the same time cannot always have been technoscience and has been transformed into technoscience. So that's the kind of tension there. And then you have a number of additional tensions going on there between what then precisely that transformation is. Is it the place of science in society that has transformed? So we use science differently and that's why we call it technoscience. Or is it, as these disciplines like nanotechnology and synthetic biology suggest, something within science that has transformed? So that science has become a different way of doing science, and that's what's called technoscience, not just what we do as a society with technoscience. And finally, um, I will come, we can come back to that as well, is the kind of tension between is technoscience just a descriptive term, we just want to describe what actually is happening with, within science, or, as, as it has been used many times also, a very evaluative term, normative notion in the sense of it is a transformation that is also a regression. Or kind of problem or a new tension. Science becoming technoscience means also a kind of domination of technology over science or over society. So it's typically used in a very negative sense by a number of philosophers as well. Yeah, that that sounds imposing. So so technoscience as the 
advent of a new world order where nanotechnology and synthetic biologists take over the world. Yeah, that or even more fundamental. It's, it's a different way of looking at the world through scientific or techno-scientific means. Everything is an instrument. Everything is a tool for science. Everything is technology. That kind of way of thinking about the world. Typically seen also as a loss of different ways of thinking. We don't look at nature as something intrinsically valuable or something beautiful, but only as a tool to be used for our own means, our own societal programs. A different look uh, on the future, but let's go back to the past. You said that technoscience became a concept in the wake of, of nanotechnology, synthetic biology. So how, how should they understand the history of this concept? Did it start with nanotechnology in, say, the last 30 years or so? Or has it been around for longer? Yeah, the, there you need to see the tension. So my, my, my own interest, in a way, came from those new disciplines. But the term itself is older. That's one of the reasons why these tensions exist. So the term itself, and that complicates the story even more, has unclear origins. There's debate on who was the first to use it, in what context. For instance, one example is the term already existed in 19. 56 by a Danish engineer, uh, Schildrop, Edgar Schildrop, who spoke about Technowitenschap. But he used that term just once, it wasn't picked up. Does that mean that he's the origin of that, that concept? No, uh, I would say. Secondly, there are many precursors, authors who do not use that notion, but who we now associate with it. For instance, and, and you're familiar with that, Gaston Bachelard, his notion of phénomène technique that we spoke about in a, in a previous session. Is typically linked with that as well. Again, it's a kind of connection between science and technology in a very similar way. But Bachelard never used that notion of techno science. The term itself was used uh, and picked up significantly only from the 1970s on. But then again, also in two contexts. One is the uh, more in the USA social scientists like Dwight Waldo or W. Henry Lambright used it to describe precisely a kind of shift in. Yeah, the institutionalization of science. We use techno-scientific institutions, techno-scientific systems in the U.S. government, etc., to regulate science, to develop science, etc. And at the same time, in the 1970s, then you had, in a completely different context, in Belgium, Gilbert Autois, philosopher at the ULB, who spoke also about technoscience in French, but really more in a fundamental philosophical sense, really as a way to reconceptualize what's what science is about. Science is, in its essence, about technology, about operational practices, not about representation, as he would call it. So in his case, it was really a more fundamental point about the nature of science. In the case of the US scientists, it was about a transformation that they saw at work. So there you have that tension. But the term was mostly popularized by Ottawa. Uh, so it was soon picked up by, for instance, Jean-François Lyotard, Bruno Latour, Donna Haraway, who then brought it back to the American context in a different way and mixed it up with uh, what these other scholars were doing. And then you have a strong uh, yeah, set of extra uh, affinities with the practical turn in philosophy and history of science, where they indeed started to focus on instruments and experiments. And then there was a kind of affinity there as well. And it's only then where these things come together around the 1990s, around 2000, when nanotechnology and synthetic biology later became object of concern for philosophers, that they picked up that notion of technoscience and applied that to these disciplines as well. So it was a loaded term that they then applied to these disciplines. And that, that complicates a bit the history of that concept, but also for me provokes a number of interesting questions. Uh, how new is what what is going on in these new fields? Is it not something that also was already happening earlier on or is part of the essence of science. And that's what that notion of technoscience for me provokes. Thanks, that's, that's very interesting. And it clearly is an interesting concept to use to uh, discuss the history of science or science uh, branches in general. But in the introduction, you also seem to uh, hint that the concept can also be used as a societal diagnosis. Can you tell me more about that? That's indeed one of the first first big clusters of how that notion is used. And it's now typically associated with SCS as a field, Science and Technology Studies, through the work of Bruno Latour and Donna Haraway who have used that notion. It's, like, it's often very hard to get a grip on what they always mean with that term, but in general it's really about either a transformation of 
uh, our current society, in, some, in a techno-scientific society. It's this intuition that nowadays technology is omnipresent in, in politics, in our daily lives. We cannot avoid it anymore. And then the idea is, and that's the second dimension, that we also should reconceptualize what science and technology is about if we want to understand that position of science and technology in our society. And so it has developed and it has become very popular in the sense that even uh, you have journals and fields that define themselves through that notion of technoscience. Uh, for instance, feminist technoscience is a kind of label that scholars also use to describe their own work as a kind of almost synonym with STS. And more recently, you also have post-colonial technoscience or crip technoscience. So these are disciplines, groups of scholars who try to precisely diagnose in what way in our current society is science and technology changing our relation with one another and also changing power structures, changing inequality. For instance, at the feminist perspective, it's about how does gender tensions, gender inequalities, etc. change through the development of new technologies about uh, reproduction, about factories, etc. And more recently, the same with the crypt techno sciences about, indeed, uh, disabled persons. How do they evaluate, interpret these techno-scientific applications in a radically different way? Then techno science is really a diagnosis of the times we live in and of modernity. But you also said that it can also be used as a prescriptive term. Uh, how, how should I see that then? Is it different from this diagnosis or this descriptive use of the term or is it linked somehow? At first sight these sociologists seem very descriptive about it but often they are also very prescriptive in the sense that they sometimes also see technoscience as a kind of liberation from classical dichotomies. The classical distinctions between nature and technology, nature and society do not uphold anymore. We can free ourselves or we should free ourselves from that. As far as these sociologists are prescriptive, they are often very optimistic about uh, what technoscience also can offer us. But that differs well, in a radical sense from how technoscience is also used in more well, philosophy of technology circles with a tradition that is typically traced back to Heidegger and Martin Heidegger, who has a kind of strong pessimistic diagnosis of uh, the role of technology in our society. He doesn't use the notion of technoscience himself, but it's one of these precursors that seems to suggest very similar things. And that is then built on by Lyotard, for instance, also by Jürgen Habermas, more recently also by Stichler and a number of other French scholars. So when they talk about technoscience, they typically have that pessimistic diagnosis, this kind of Becoming dominant of the techno-scientific way of looking at the world is also problematic in one way or another. Something is lost there, because it's all reduced to a very instrumental way of dealing with the world. A typical diagnosis in that context is also, there is no room anymore for true philosophical thinking, because even philosophy as a discipline has to transform itself to follow these instrumental criteria of you have to have output, you have to have applications, imp societal impact, etc., Technoscience for them also, in that sense, doesn't refer to specific technological applications, but rather a kind of different worldview, a different way of, in more Heideggerian terms, it's also a different way of how the world shows itself to us and how it presents itself to us. And that has a kind of um, radical effect on what kind of technology we develop, what the place of technology is in society. So there we have again the dystopian future of the technoscience, where there isn't even a place for philosophy anymore. Yeah, so for that type of pessimistic diagnoses and, and kind of moral panics about these technologies, you should look into um, these more general diagnoses of modernity as a techno-scientific period or something like that. And how can we then understand modernity in a techno-scientific way? Because modernity has been going on for quite a while now already. Again, that depends on what other you're looking at. Uh, I think Heidegger would be very pessimistic, probably, and say that well, the techno-scientific era can be traced back to Plato, or something like that, and slowly develops itself and shows itself now more clearly. In the case of Lyotard, it's, in that sense, a bit more optimistic, in that he would link it with the postmodern period, where precisely these classical grand narratives do not shape what we do with science and technology anymore. We don't pursue science and technology for emancipation. That's not the story we tell ourselves, according to Lyotard. It's really this kind of performative logic of efficiency, increasing output for its own sake for Lyotard. And that really starts, in his terms, 
really around the Second World War or something like that. So that's technoscience situated historically, but you also said that it, it can also be seen as something ahistorically, as a sort of essence of science. Can you can you explain how that would work? Yeah, that was one of the central ambiguities there. That is either an essentialist thesis about the essence of science or a kind of historical thesis about how science has transformed itself. And yeah, the boundary is not always that strict. For instance, Lyotard, at other moments, to stick with him, would say, well, no postmodernity is not even a period. It's a different modus, a different way of dealing with the world, etc., which can occur in any historical period. So it's it has to do with a different... Yeah, different essence of science, you could say. And technoscience then refers to a different essence of science from science. And that's also one way to look at it. More in that line, figures like Bruno Latour, uh, who was also partly inspired by Lyotard, or more recently Don Heide in his post phenomenology, they use technoscience, again, not as a negative term. They t- typically tend to be more neutral or uh, optimistic about it. And they see it really as a kind of term to capture the essence of what science is all about. And then they want to correct a certain kind of view of a science is typically thought in terms of yeah, language, thought. And we think science as referring to a set of propositions about the world, a theory about the world, a language about the world, mathematics, for instance. Whereas they would say, no, if you look in these terms to the world, you miss something about science, namely all the instrumental, technical, practical sides of science. And we do things through science with the world. We do experiments, we change the world through science. And if you only think about science as a kind of representation of reality, then you miss these aspects. And that goes back a bit to the Gilbert Vautois who originally popularized that term in the 1970s. So when he used that term, it was actually in his dissertation about Wittgenstein and, and the inflation of language in philosophy. It was, as the title already a bit hints at, a kind of critique of we philosophers in the 1970s going through the linguistic turn, we tend to think about everything in terms of language. And Otto was a bit uncomfortable with that when he was looking to science again, because he saw in science something extra-linguistic at work as well. He was warning philosophers to not forget the world, not forget materiality, etc. So his alternative picture of science, and it really has to do with, for him, the essence of science, although he saw it more clearly at work in contemporary sciences, uh, was science is not representational, but science is operational. That science installs certain operations that we can then perform to the world. And one was clearly, again, that instrumental, material, experimental dimension. That we do experiments with, with the world, although even uh, we can control the world in certain ways, although we might not have even a theory about it. But he also thought about mathematics as operational. So mathematics could not for him be reduced to a language to describe the world. It was also a set of procedures to transform and change and do something with the world, even if you cannot well, represent anything with these mathematical operators. So what is an imaginary number? No idea, but you can do something with that uh, notion to the world, something like that. Again, uh, probably uh, you might feel it already, uh, there's some kind of affinities with Bachelard on, the, on these points as well. But that mathematical dimension was a bit forgotten, as we talked about also in the case of Bachelard. Uh, Latour and Donati, they don't really use mathematics as a case. They tend to focus really on the material, practical, instrumental um, dimensions. But they really see it as a, as a different picture of science that we need now. So there is a kind of historical diagnosis linked to that of we are now living in times where we need to reconceptualize science, but how science has always been, not just how it has recently transformed itself. Isn't it a bit ironic or maybe even tragic for Hotois then that with his Wittgensteinian preoccupation about the inflation of language in philosophy of science he launches yet another term in philosophy of science and at the same time it then later gets picked up and as we have seen it can mean a plethora of things now so it's more like an extra layer in philosophy of science an extra thing to talk about and doesn't it just complicate things or does it obfuscate something uh, within philosophy of science rather than being the useful concept that he intended? Yeah, you mean that the only result that his attempts had was introduce another concept, more language in Another in philosophy inflation. Of science. Yeah. yeah. Although at the same time he was not anti-Wittgenstein, as far as I can tell. He was deeply also inspired by Wittgenstein in that sense. Um, so he would accept that there are forms of 
that there are uses and forms of life with these concepts and that that that, that is acceptable. But yeah, he um, so he wrote, he recently died, I think 2019, if I'm correct. And he, in his last years, he wrote also histories of that concept. He looked back on, on that concept as well. And he was sometimes a bit pessimistic of indeed how liberally it has been used, especially by the sociologists, and how that really material and especially also mathematical dimension was lost. So yeah, he was not always happy with how it has been picked up by others. He might not be very happy with, with how things turned out, but we see techno science today flourish as a term. So can it be of use today? And is it maybe overused or what do you think? Obviously, since I'm focusing on that term, I think there is something into that. It's useful to look at that term. I think it does offer us at least a number of questions that we should raise about what science today means. It doesn't for me present a neat answer. It's precisely these ambiguities that provoke in me and hopefully in others as well these questions that we shouldn't be too quick to see all these new things as new. We should pose these questions about how has it developed historically? Has it always been the case? What is the precise nature of these transformations, etc.? Because there, there are also a number of, I think, legitimate criticisms of that term. People are often oppose it because for them it erases precisely distinctions that they want to uphold. For instance, the distinction between science and technology. And there is a risk in calling everything technoscience that you also erase meaningful differences between what scientific research, perhaps in its more basic form, is about and what technological applications are about. For instance, the question about upscaling, and that's a critique by Hans Radder. There is a difference between doing one experiment in a lab and making that work and showing it to others, publishing about it, and upscaling that to a level of the whole society. I take the example of vaccines. It's different from showing the vaccine works in this test lab versus upscaling it and distributing it over the world. And technoscience seems to suggest that it's all the same in a way. And that's uh, one of these criticisms by Hans Radder in that sense. And it's more aimed at this kind of essentialist thesis, in the sense that uh, if you indeed see science as, in essence, technoscience, you lose the connotations that the notion of science has. For instance, also, th there is, I think, a reason why mathematics and its more conceptual dimensions has disappeared from these technoscientific reflections, because the term itself doesn't point at the role of concepts, the role of theory. It precisely tries to push them back to the background. Similarly, the, the more historical claims also have a number of issues, obviously, namely about what, when, and where was this epochal break between science and technoscience. As, as we talked already a bit about it, no one really agrees when it started and what it really means. There is always a possibility with any claim that this is the moment, if you say this is the moment when technoscience started, that someone shows a case to, to centuries before that seems similar in, in that and that respect. Typical case is synthetic chemistry in the 19th century has a lot of properties about them, making its own object, linked with industry, creating true instruments and technology, etc., new artifacts, that is ascribed to all these new disciplines. So what is the difference between synthetic chemistry and synthetic biology, for instance? That's the kind of tension that you often see. So in that sense, the critics of the term really are unhappy with, uh, they, don't, they don't see the, the added value in that sense, they see only confusion. Whereas my point of view would precisely be, I think that confusion is a confusion that makes us think about what science is about. Whereas the notion of science seems, again, more clear and self-evident. Replacing it with technoscience provokes a number of questions. Yes, if you want to use technoscience, well, then we have to be clear about what we mean with technology, with science, when has this happened, what is this about, etc. Yeah, I have to admit that I'm also a bit confused now because you said that the critique of Hans Radder was that, well, Basically, technoscience made it less clear that when you go from the laboratory to industry and, and to, well, upscale it to the, the large society, science it is, that the technoscience would obfuscate how that would work. But I thought that you said that technoscience is a term that helps to understand science as a practical thing that just wants to clarify that this is not the case. So which of these is it? And then how can you, well... Please explain to me how this confusion came to be and, and why I'm confused. I think it's a very good question and it has to do with a certain ambiguity of the ambition of technoscience. So technoscience wants to precisely erase all these distinctions between science and technology, saying that 
They are not separate. Science is always linked with technological applications, with societal goals, etc. To resituate science also within society and resituate it within actual practices of doing things, making your hands dirty, etc. Not just theory or a kind of fundamental basic research. But the risk is then to to easily equate them and to, to forget what, what is needed in addition in the technological and uh, in industrial sphere, etc. In the case of Pernod Latour, for instance, you base your reflections on what technoscience is, for instance, on the work of Louis Pasteur or uh, the studies of one lab in uh, California, and then you extrapolate it to this is how science or technoscience is always and everywhere the case. Whereas you have a very limited empirical data on which you base yourself linked with science and not with industry in, 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 in the classical sense. So Hans Helder's point is precisely that, well, if you indeed want to equate them, you have to have the full story and not just claim that you talk about technoscience, but de facto base yourself only on what classically would be seen as more fundamental basic research. I see. So that that's indeed another way then that we can think about science and it gives an, another angle to how to question science. And as you said to in your answer to my previous question, it helps to well problematize how we think about science and you. So maybe that's then the added value of thinking in terms of techno science in philosophy of science, or do I see that wrongly? Yeah, so it might be linked to that tension in the sense that, to put it very bluntly, you can also say, well, techno science, the risk is there that it seems to talk about technology, but it's actually some kind of philosophy of science incomplete, or the stakes, in it, at least in the first instance, were also always about philosophy of science. And they want to use technology to say something about science, but not so much the other way around, to say something about technology in the non-scientific way, in the sense of industry, in the sense of uh, the, the cars driving outside, etc., which were the applications of it. And indeed, I think the value is perhaps of that notion of technoscience is more in, for instance, philosophy of science, and then the provocation is precisely if you want to link it back to these disciplines like nanotechnology and synthetic biology, that maybe we should talk about it in terms of technoscience because the scientific practices in what they do, what they aim for, etc., has also transformed themselves. One way, and uh, I associate this with Alfred Nordmann, who is interested in these questions, is precisely that shift in science in the form of technoscience doesn't aim so much anymore for offering a, an adequate representation of reality. The aim is not we want to have the model, the theory that then can adequately represent how the world works, but rather it wants yeah, to have a kind of practical knowledge about control of the world. We just want to control this phenomena, control that the cells will behave in this and this way, control that the materials will do in this and this and have this and this property. And that kind of broader ambition of do we also then understand what that material is or what how that cell actually works becomes less interesting for these scientists. They are more interested in kind of operationalizing these theories, these insights, these applications. Another element typically also linked, I think Xavier Guchet is one of these figures, linked to Gilbert Simondon, about a shift perhaps also in the kind of object of, of technoscience. And that has to do with, again, technosciences, they do not aim for big theories, they do not aim to find out the laws of nature in any classical sense, but they focus on the individual object. We want this system to work fully under our control. We want this cell to do what we want it to do. So you have to approach questions, philosophical questions about science in a different way. You don't have to talk about what is a law, you have to talk about what is an object, what is a technological object, how does that behave, what does the scientist want to do with it, what can it tell us about the world, etc., something like that. So it's a kind of shift in what are the questions that the philosopher of science should ask when we are faced with these new disciplines. And they shift away from a number of very classical philosophy of science questions. Then again, the, the idea of controlling objects, isn't that also an ancient question in, in philosophy of science? Isn't that, for example, to speak with Bachelard, what, what's the old Newtonian scientific paradigm would say it, it's aspired to? Again, I think that's also partly the reason why you have all these ambiguities about this historical and essentialist claims with technoscience. Because it's always a question also of what kind of history of philosophy of science, history of science, you are recuperating as part of your story. If you want to stress how scientists used to have the ambition to represent the world adequately, etc., which has also existed, 
then you're opposing yourself against them. But at the same time, there are also people precisely saying, well, this this techno-scientific ideal, you can trace it back to Francis Bacon. And this whole classical project of, again, having kind of control over the world. Or very you know, the whole history of positivism in that sense can also be linked to that. So in that sense, I think, again, it has to do with what kind of story you tell about the history of science and history of philosophy of science, whether it is seen as an ally to that notion of techno-science or not. So it's a question of who's the enemy here. Who is the position you're arguing against um, that is at work? Is it recent analytic philosophy of science? Is it philosophy of science in general? Is it societal ways of thinking about science? And that, that also um, depends on how plausible that story is and who the enemy of that story is. And I tend to be historical in that sense that I indeed acknowledge that there are affinities with Francis Bacon, with Newton, if you want, etc. But there is also a risk there in we probably had different aims. I don't think Bacon or Newton had the same aims with their philosophies, nor with their sciences that we do. But we ca can find a kind of affinity there. But that, that's it, not nothing more, I would say. And which aims do we then have, or which aims should we have for the future, and maybe for the future of techno-science or philosophy of science? Yeah, that's in the, the following question. So indeed, if you rewrite the history of science and the history of philosophy of science as a history of aims, different ambitions, what scientists had and what philosophers had, to think about that, then I would say that the interesting question becomes not so much is a techno-scientific discipline like synthetic biology now really constructing its object or just representing it, but why are they doing it? What is the kind of ambition? What is the kind of questions? What is the function of that science? And then I would say one of the points that I'm focusing on in my own research is precisely a shift in the kind of questions that they are interested in. That's one way how I would define techno-science in these recent disciplines shift away from questions about actualities. This is how the world really is. We want to understand how life on Earth really functions to questions about possibilities. Regardless how they exist right now, we want to create new forms of life. It's what are possible ways in which life can exist? Can we create an artificial cell? Can we create a form of life based on an alternative chemistry? That kind of questions. And I think that's applicable, that logic of looking into possibilities also to these other fields like nanotechnology, what are the possible forms of materials, robotics, what are possible forms of movement, you could say, and, and even data science and AI is in a way the question, what are the possible forms of decisions or intelligence, right? It's not that interested anymore in trying to recreate the existing form, but also immediately explore alternative forms. And so that also leads to, for me, the, the kind of interesting questions that these new techno-scientific disciplines have. Um, but I would call that kind of uh, nowadays kind of ecological view of techno science, and it has to do with a very old intuition in philosophy of technology, namely no technology comes without an environment, without an ecology. If you want to have a car, you have to build your city around that car. You have to have streets, you have to have uh, laws, etc., to install it. You have to train people to drive a car, all that kind of thing. Your life with or without a car is completely different, and I think that the same question is raised with all these new techno scientific applications. If you want to use algorithms, you have to create a world in which these algorithms can do their job. Same with robotics. If you want to have little drones delivering packages through the streets, you have to make sure that the streets are adapted to these little robots. Or it's same with drones, so you have to you have to adapt the, the, the airspace to them, etc. And that so that kind of relational ecological point combined with that shift from actualities to possibilities leads to me to the question, well, if indeed these techno scientists abandon in a way the actual world for dreams about possible worlds, then what kind of environments would that require? In the sense that they dream of a kind of environment where self-driving cars, for instance, work, that is in a way completely indifferent to humans, because it's not a reference point anymore. You don't need human drivers anymore. You can build a completely separate society. And I think that's, the, for me, the, the relevant question, the ecological question of technoscience. So, so that's also where the dystopian ideas come from, really. The indifference of an ecology of technoscientific world. Yeah, it can be dystopic if you think about it. I'm a bit more optimistic, in the sense it's not determined, it's still open, and you can, can develop technology in different ways. And I think we really have to pose that question. But my intuition is, 
these techno scientists themselves they are thinking about how to rearrange the world around their cell driving cars and around the synthetic cells that can only live within these very specific environments etc but we have to wonder what we want to accept that world and so for me the kind of question about a new technology is it good or bad is a question about conditions what kind of conditions are required for a technology to work and do we want to accept those conditions do we if that's the kind of conditions that are needed to have self-driving cars do i want that kind of society um, so for me choosing a certain technology is choosing a certain society and it's still open for, for these new new um, techno scientific applications but we really should start having that debate on what kind of society do we want or what kind of society would that technology imply and do do we want to live in that world it's very interesting I would like to start a debate immediately, but maybe that's something for another episode. Thanks for being here and, and talking about techno science, and hopefully we'll have that debate in another episode. Yep, uh, thanks for having me, and I would love to, of course, talk more about techno science. But hopefully we'll meet again the next time.